Sox fans, Dickie Davis will be here at 11.35 with highlights of the day's play at the British Open Snooker Championships. And then at 1 o'clock, Tony Francis with Sports World. That's on Monday. Now, Speed Chess. Hello and welcome to the second semi-final in the James Capel Speed Chess Challenge. Last week, young Michael Adams sensationally defeated John Spielman. Tonight, in the other semi-final, Dr John Nunn plays white against Nigel Short. Good evening, Dr Nunn. Well, I'm a bit nervous about this game. Uh, I think this is going to be a completely different matter uh, than my game with Jonathan Mestel. Nigel's got a very good record at this time limit. He uh, once won the British Open Championship with 11 points out of 11. And he took two games off the world champion Garry Kasparov in um, a match they played some time ago. So uh, I'm feeling a little bit nervous, but uh, I'll try my usual openings and uh, mm -hmm. see what happens. Mm -hmm. E4. Yes, uh, John, John and I, uh, for the past... Uh, I don't know how many games, uh, a good number of games, have always uh, started with uh, E4, E5. And I think this is uh, probably because we're both a little bit nervous about each other. John, when he's black, instead of trying something sharp like the Sicilian defence, just prefers to stick his pawn in the, the centre because this is a, gives him a very secure feeling. And myself, instead of playing something a little bit uh, more strategically uh, 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 complicated, uh, uh, like the French defence. Uh, I again don't want to give him uh, an, a chance to attack me uh, at least uh, immediately. So I played e5. But something there's a complicating factor here, which I think I should elucidate before we proceed, and that is that you, Nigel, were playing in the World Championship, and your assistant in the World Championship was. Dr. John Nunn. Yes. And presumably you spent many, many hours burning the midnight oil together, analysing what to play against various opponents. So isn't it difficult for both of you to have to play against someone who has been a very close friend and ally, someone who's helped you in your deepest thoughts and preparation? And isn't it very difficult to find something new, something you haven't uh, discussed already? Uh, I, I think it, it is a little bit uh, of a problem. But uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously I know John's game very well and vice versa. Is this a problem for you too, John, or is this a...? Well, I don't think it's so much of a problem uh, in the sense that we've analysed a lot of different openings, because there are plenty of other openings which we yes. haven't analysed. <laughs> uh, but I think there is a, a psychological problem in that we have worked together for such a long time, um, that uh, playing against someone who's a good friend, I, I personally find uh, quite difficult, and I would far prefer to play somebody I don't know particularly well than someone I know extremely well. So you can work up feelings of hostility? Not, not necessarily, <laughs> but, um, but perhaps it is slightly easier in that case. Um, but despite the fact that we've been working together for some time, we seem, seem to have quite interesting games together whenever we meet right. over the board. So how did you overcome your friendship and manage to make a second move against John? <laughs> well, a uh, quick look at my ticking clock uh, encouraged me to play knight f3. Uh, knight c6. Still following my usual openings, bishop b5. That's called the Roy Lopez. Yes, or, the, Spa or the Spanish opening in the rest of the world. Um, for those who aren't initiates uh, in the, uh, the secret Eleusinian mysteries of chess, would you like to explain why it's called the Roy Lopez, or the Spanish, as you... Well, also because of the, uh, the uh, famous Spanish player, Roy Lopez, who was apparently one of the best players in the world, uh, recommended this opening. When was he one of the best players in the world? Well, you would know more about this. Uh, <laughs> right. yes. having, I'm sure written some books on the subject. Yes, it was in the 16th century in Spain, and he was one of the, one of the early... Uh, noted chess players, and he recommended uh, 
Let's move bishop to b5. And he also recommended positioning the board so that it reflected the light into your opponent's eyes. So he was an early oh. exponent of psychology as well. Oh, gamesmanship. <laughs> <laughs> well, I played a6, which is uh, the most common move in this position. Bishop drops back to a4. And uh, developing move, knight f6. This is all standard and has been played thousands and thousands of times. Castles. And you, did you consider taking off the pawn on e4 now, Nigel? No, it's a variation I've, I've never analysed. Oh, well, at least not from um, the black side. Right, and, and white gets the pawn back fairly easily. He gets know. the pawn back fairly easily. And it leads to uh, uh, a sort of game which I, I don't like too much. So I just played the very quiet bishop e7. White now defends his pawn with rook e1. And now white threatens to win a pawn with bishop takes knight and knight takes e5. So I uh, defend against this with b5. My reply is forced, bishop b3. And uh, d6. White's plan in this opening is to build up his pawn centre with c3 and d4. Sometimes he, well, in fact, most of the time he has to play h3 as well to prevent black playing bishop g4 uh, and removing the important knight. But for the, the first part of this plan, I can play c3 now. Uh, again, I just uh, continue with that development, counselling. It is possible to play d4 straight away, but after bishop g4, this leads to a completely different type of position. But I'll play the most common move, h h3. If you, uh, again, if you're looking at this position to the eyes of an inexperienced player, John, I know that this is all, you know, for players like you, this is well-known theory, and it's occurred hundreds of times, and uh, probably you dream about positions like this, I don't know, but <laughs> for the inexperienced player, it looks as if White spent a lot of time moving his bishop around the board, that's the bishop that's now on b3, wandering it backwards and forwards, that he's played two rather insignificant little pawn moves, the pawn on c3 and the pawn on h3, while Black's been getting on with the game and bringing his pieces out. And yet, everybody uh, is saying that uh, White has the better chances in positions like this. I mean, how can you explain this apparent paradox? Well, the reason is that White has made an investment in time in order to be sure of forming a good pawn centre with, with pawns at d4 and e4. And in fact, in fact, it usually happens that Black has to return the time that White has sacrificed himself in order to challenge this pawn centre. So the whole thing ends up being balanced. Uh -huh. So, uh, in this position, I, I played an idea which um, was popular, well, a few decades ago. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, uh, an, the, the idea is, is simply to strong point um, e5. Uh, I played knight d7, which looks like a, a complete waste of time. But uh, as John has pointed out, he, he's about to stick his pawn on d4 which puts some pressure on my centre, and I wanted to uh, defend this. I seem to remember that this move was championed by the um, old uh, Russian world champion Tigran Petrosyan. I think he played it in one of his matches yes. with Boris Spassky. That's right, yes. And uh, also uh, uh, the Russian player Chigorin from, uh, you know, the last century was... Oh, the founder of the Soviet uh, school uh, of chess. Yes, he was also, also playing uh, in a similar style. Well, it's an interesting choice of variation by Nigel. I know he's played this uh, a few times recently, uh, indeed twice at uh, the recent tournament in Tilburg where he, he came second. So, uh, although it's a little bit unusual, in this particular case it's not a surprise because I know he's been uh, playing knight d7 quite a bit recently. d4. And uh, there were numerous moves here, like bishop b7, knight b6, but uh, I wanted to defend e5 with bishop f6. Well, I suppose uh, I better follow the theoretical recommendation here, which is to try and exploit the slight weakness of black's queenside by playing a4. And uh, I have to defend my rook on a8, so I play a developing move, bishop b7. Now, white's plan is to try and attack the pawn on b5 but it's um, supposed to be best to first of all exchange pawns and then rooks so as to leave black with an undefended b5 pawn which can then be attacked. So I take on b5. I recapture, simply. And rook takes a8. And uh, here 
I took recaptured with the Queen. I had played uh, a game against John in Hastings where I'd retaken with the, the Bishop, and this leads to slightly different uh, positions. But yeah, I thought I'd seen this position before somewhere. I was yeah. uh, looking at the game while it was played, and uh, I, I had this feeling that I'd seen a game of new to somewhere before that was very similar, but I couldn't quite pinpoint where the difference was. Yes. Well, I was hoping he was going to repeat Bishop takes a8 because I had something good against it, mm -hmm. but uh, he decided to take back with the Queen this time. Well, this is a position which I've never had before in my own games. Uh, so I decided to simply f follow the recommendation given in one of the standard opening books, the Encyclopedia of Chess Openings, which is to play the move d5. And my, I brought my knight back to the uh, s square, which are vacated by my bishop, knight, knight e7. That's quite interesting, because uh, this encyclopedia gives knight a5 as being the best move, and considers that knight e7 leads to a clear advantage for white. Well, I'm sure Nigel's got some improvement prepared, so let's see what it is. Knight a3. And uh, I have some small problems with my, my b pawn in this position. So um, I decided to play bishop a6. Well, that's the, the move uh, he has to play. And now knight c2 would be following the theoretical line. Possibly other moves. Uh, reasonable, maybe bishop e3, I don't know. Let, let me just make a move on the board as a variation, which we'll just show briefly. I thought that you might perhaps consider playing the bishop to c2, with the idea of then pushing up the pawn to b4, to try and fix the, uh, the black pawn on b5. I'll just put the pieces back where they were. But uh, having shown the viewers that, that, that idea, what did you think of that? Well, the problem is that black can play c6 um, immediately and uh, this is his main source of counterplay. So if you, if you move the bishop here, yes. then black would break up with c6 like this? I believe so, yes. 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 And then the, the knight on a3 would be uh, uh, particularly badly placed because the, the bishop would have taken away that uh, square. Right. So uh, this is my idea, of course. I have to play c6. Otherwise, I, I just have a, a cramped position. Right. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a question of playing it at the, at the right moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the two most reasonable moves must be bishop e3 and knight c2. Mm -hmm. uh, and I decided to continue following this theoretical line, so I played knight c2. Uh, knight c5 to embarrass the bishop on uh, b3. And knight b4. And uh, it's always good to remove this, this bishop. Knight takes b3. Queen takes b3 is forced. And I dropped my bishop back to b7 because uh, my bishop is now uncomfortably placed. It's fulfilled its job on a6. And uh, I now prepare c6 at uh, a later moment. Yes, it's uh, not so easy to find a uh, constructive plan for white here. This is a position was supposed to be distinctly better for white. This is still the theory yes, in, the, yes, uh, in the book? Yes, indeed. And it gives this position as being uh, clearly better for white. But in fact, a constructive plan for white is not so easy to find. I would like, for example, to get my route to the A file, but that's very difficult because I can't control A1. Yes, Alexander Alekin, the, the famous former world champion in the 1930s and 1940s, said that whenever you open the A file in the Royal Lopez, it's better for white. Um, but it seems to me that in this position you've opened the A file, but blacks are uh, in charge of it. Well, it's not doing him that much good, but it's more important is the fact that I can't gain control of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if I could, for example, completely prevent him from playing c6 in some way, for example, by pressurising d6, then white would have the advantage. But in fact, he's already preparing to play rook d8, uh, and then probably to push the, <coughs> push the uh, c port, and to completely stop this counterplay is extremely difficult. I decided to complete my development anyway and played bishop e3. Well, as John uh, uh, has mentioned already, this uh, is all in the books uh, up to this point. And uh, I'd analysed this position a little bit before the game, and uh, I came to the conclusion that Black was doing reasonably well here, um, mainly because um, I thought about White's position, and I, I didn't really um, see a, a very constructive plan. And um, I do have a plan. Uh, 
I want to play c6. I have to prepare this some, somehow. I can play c6 immediately, but uh, J John would simply, uh, after c6, he would capture. Uh, bishop takes, he would take on c6. And uh, after queen takes c6, queen b4 uh, is, leads to a more comfortable position for, for white. Now, as you'll see later on, we reached uh, something quite similar to this in the, the game, but uh, I'd gained an extra temper. I played h6, which prevents knight g5, bishop g5, but more importantly, uh, gives my, my king an escape square, should there be, uh, uh, you know, the possibilities of uh, back rank. Yes, when I saw this move played, I was wondering, I wasn't, I was, wasn't sure whether your plan was to play c6 and bust open the centre, whether you had some sort of hyper-subtle long-range idea of playing a king to h7, pawn to g6, the bishop here, and then attacking on the king side yes, with that. Yes, this is... Uh, um, Maybe I'll try that in my next game. <laughs> I, I suggested this to Larry Evans, the US champion, who was analysing the game with me while you were playing. And he said, don't be silly, Ray. This is much too, <laughs> much too, much too uh, convoluted. But I, I, I wasn't sure. I thought this might have been at the back of your mind when you played h6. Yeah. Oh, h6 is a very good general purpose move. Uh, if, for example, I attempt to manoeuvre my knight from f3 to a better position, then black can play bishop g5. Um, uh, but the main question it poses is what White's next move is going to be, because White actually lacks a really constructive move. Uh, I decided that it would be a good idea um, to improve the position of the rook on e1, which isn't doing very much. But I didn't just want to play rook d1 when uh, Black would play rook d8. So I, I instead had the idea to play rook c1 with two ideas. First of all, if I now break through with c4, then after the exchange on c4, he can't immediately reply at c6 because I'd have too many pieces on that square. And the second idea is maybe to play queen d1 and rook a1 and again to seize control of the a file. Of course, I realise that uh, rook, a, rook c1 is almost certainly going to be met by the advance of the c pawn, but actually I couldn't find a more constructive move, so rook c1. And uh, here I, I was afraid of uh, c4. So uh, it's, it's time now to, to, to play uh, c6. Um, I've gained this, uh, this very uh, valuable extra move. And I now uh, was able to exploit um, the uh, weak position of the, uh, the, the pawn on e4. Well, I have to take this pawn. And uh, we capture with the bishop. And I can't uh, allow this queen and bishop line up on the diagonal pointing at my weak e-pawn to persist, so I must exchange the bishop. And queen takes c6, attacking e4 and also defending my b-pawn. Well, it's a difficult moment for me. The uh, position is becoming simplified and I would prefer not to play Nigel in a, in a five-minute game. So I'd like to try and make something of this position. Um, C4 perhaps is one possibility, but again, I'm helping him in a way by exchanging off uh, his weak b5 pawn. The alternative is to just defend the pawn on e4 with queen b4, which also uh, retains white's pressure against the pawns on b5 and d6. Of course, the danger of this queen move is that he's going to be able to respond at some point by playing d5. But fortunately, he can't do this immediately because I could uh, simply take the pawn on e5. So, queen b4. And now here, it, it was a question merely of uh, where I was going to develop my rook, whether I was going to put it on a8, uh, with the idea of coming down to a4, uh, or to, to, to put it on e8 to defend my knight, or maybe even to uh, d8. To, uh, this all move also has its uh, points. But uh, I decided to, to play um, in a very direct fashion and just to uh, try and blast open with d5. If you, if you try to play d5 now at once, yes. like this, uh, perhaps Mike can... Uh, no, no, I just no. take the pawn off. Oh, the, you just take the pawn at once? Okay. Yes, that's right. Pawn for and nothing. after bishop takes, queen takes here, mm -hmm. and uh, just a pawn down. Right. 
So rook e8 uh, defends against that? Yes. Uh, is that a possibility? That's, that's it's a very right. subtle move. I, uh, I don't think anybody watching the game had foreseen that. Have you, have you thought about that possibility? Well, I had thought about it. I was kind of hoping he wouldn't <laughs> play it because uh, now it's virtually impossible for me to prevent him playing d5. Mm -hmm. Almost the only move which would stop this would be to play c4. But no. I don't believe this gives white any advantage. No. I saw that after rook d1, he could play d5, but it involves, well, perhaps a slight element of risk he has to think about the position. And I was hoping that at this quick time limit, perhaps he'd take a safety first attitude and uh, not play d5. Yeah. Um, so I thought I'd try book d1. Well, so I, knew, I, knew, I knew deep down that he probably would play d5. Element of bluff in your next move. Well, I can't well. see a better move. <laughs> <laughs> Even now. Yeah. So book d1. Yes. And, uh, well, I, 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 there's no, no way I can play passively in this position. I, uh, really have to, to play d5, otherwise black has a, a very cramped game. And uh, this, as John uh, has said, that uh, this move does involve some risk. I, I have to calculate the next few moves very accurately, uh, but uh, fortunately I managed to do so. Well, unfortunately he uh, seems to have decided correctly, I think, that the tactics resulting from this move are quite okay for him. Well, I must take, anyway. Knight takes d5. Now, if white's going to do anything, it has to be something tactical, because black's pieces are now fully as active as white's. So the only move to give him any problems at all is uh, to pin the knight with queen e4. And now I simply defended the knight with a rook d8. Well, for the moment, it looks as though black is in a slightly awkward situation. His knight is pinned against the queen and sort of half pinned against the rook on d8. And the crucial question is whether or not I can capture this hanging pawn on e5. Can you show us what would happen well, if you did? Well, if I take the pawn, right. he would play queen, queen to e6. Six. Pinning the And now knight. it's a counter pin on my knight, which I'd have to defend. And there are three ways to defend the knight, and unfortunately all of them have some unsatisfactory aspects to them. Right, so can you just run through them yes. quickly? Yes, first of all, bishop f4, knight takes f4. I must take on d8 now because my rook is undefended. Bishop takes d8. d8. Queen takes f4, and now bishop, bishop c7. c7. A very unpleasant pin on the knight, which would win a piece. Very neat. So that's possibility number one. Which doesn't work. Which doesn't work. Possibility number two is to play f4, f4, f4 knight, knight takes, e3. rook to takes take d8, again, bishop must take, queen takes, e3. And, and now, now bishop b6, winning, so winning the queen. Winning the queen. Yes, so it's, it's, it's almost like a wonderful coincidence, isn't it's it? A, <laughs> well, it, it's nice, the two variations, mm. the bishop gives pins on parallel diagonals. Mm. So there's the third possibility, which, unfortunately, also doesn't work, and that's to play bishop d4. And in a sense, this is the most difficult one to see, I think. Well, this knight takes c3 move. Yes, that's a wonderful move. Yes. A bishop um, takes c3 is impossible. Yes. Let's just see why a bishop takes c3. Well, then the rook on d1 drops off with check. D, of course. Check. So I would have to take this with the pawn. pawn. And then I would play bishop takes knight, and regaining well. uh, my pawn with, uh, because of the pin on the d file. Because so, of yes. the pin on the d file. White can't play bishop takes. Same reason. For the same reason. Right. Yeah. Takes d1 check. And just with a, a completely drawn But game. in fact, in, the, in this position, just before we leave it, uh, although the position's drawn and equal, Black's actually got a sneaky threat, hasn't he? Well, he does have... I think I might notice uh, <laughs> just show them what the threat of show the bishop h2 yes, check which actually my queen. wins the queen, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, this, so this that, sort of that would have been, would have been a, a way to get a draw. That would have been an immediate draw, and I wanted to you know, to exercise him as much as possible, although I now thought that the draw was more or less inevitable. So I tried one last idea, which was to reposition my knight to a better square where it uh, attacks the bishop. I played knight h2. Um, yes, I, I became slightly nervous at this point because I, I must admit that I, I hadn't uh, considered this move, though I suspect it's, it's also possible for... for, for black to play h5 here.
But anyway, I wanted to resolve the game uh, immediately and just get out of this, this nasty pin I had along the D file. And uh, uh, to do this, I have to defend my queen on C6 with uh, rook D6. That's another good move. I can now see that the, the draw is going to be inevitable. By putting his rook on a square where I can't take it with check, he intends simply to take on e3. And I think now there's a forced tactical continuation leading to a, a draw which neither side can genuinely hope to avoid. Well, I'll play knight g4. And now I, I had to uh, uh, play knight takes e3. Well, I might as well take on f6 now, hoping for rook takes f6 allowing rook d8 check and make next move, but I'm sure he's not going to do that. Uh, yes, I managed to, to see this little variation, which was uh, rather unpleasant, but um, simply recaptured with the pawn. Yes, now it's all becoming forced. Uh, I must now, to avoid loss of material, take the queen on c6. And I can take on c6, but uh, then I have uh, a slightly worse position. So uh, I force the draw with rook takes d1 check. I only have one legal move, king h2. Knight f1 check. I know this is a very interesting drawing mechanism. Yes, and a very common drawing mechanism. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I remember many, many years ago I had a game against Tal, which ended in, with an identical draw with the rook and knight. Well, one King more G. move for the spectators. King g1. And now... Discovered knight, check again. Knight e3, discovered check. And I just go backwards and forwards. So the king, the king goes here again and then check. And it's a draw by perpetual check. Add it for nice and Yes, well, that was a, a fascinating little draw. Mm. And it's a, a very high-class game for a, a speed chess tournament. I'm both playing a very scientific opening. And, um, in fact, improving on known theory, probably, Yes, Michael. yes. It's, uh, I, I think it's, it is an important uh, theoretical game. Yes. So now the first game's been drawn. You've had your chance with the white pieces, John. And you now have to play black against Nigel in the, uh, the five-minute playoff. And what are your thoughts before the, uh, the next stage? Well, a five-minute game has a very large element of randomness associated <laughs> with it. Uh, so, obviously, there are chances for both sides. Yes. And Nigel, what do you think about this? Well, um, after my game last year against John Spielman, where uh, I uh, uh, forgot to take his queen, uh, <laughs> I re realised that there are also uh, many chances for both sides to go wrong, so it's, it's a little bit right. like tossing a coin. OK. Well, the first game has been drawn. Uh, join us after the break for the five-minute playoff in the James Capel Speed Chess Challenge with Nigel Short playing white against John Munn playing black. water was delivered to the door like milk. An average family would need 850 pints a day. That's an entire milk float load per family per day.
Return of the Living Dead Part 2, just when you thought it was safe to be dead. The Tetley Tea Folk have pieced together another great free offer. Get your double-sided jigsaws free from Tetley. Hello there. This Venus flytrap is one of nature's only meat-eating plants. Let's see what she thinks of a few snacks, shall we? Not smitten with the beef flavor, nor the bacon flavor once. And now, pepperoni, a succulent, chewy snack made from 100% real meat. Well, Venus clearly prefers the tangy taste of pepperoni. Well, it is only a snack. Get your teeth into a pepper army. Welcome back to the James Capel Speed Chess Challenge. We're now going to join the game between Nigel Short and John Nunn in the Blitz Playoff as it happens. I'm joined in the commentary by former US champion, Grandmaster Larry Evans. And Nigel Short, playing white in the five-minute playoff, has played a move that for him is very unusual. The Queen's Pawn Open, this is very, very unusual. I've never, ever seen Nigel Short play this before. It's called the Torre Attack. Widely considered to be harmless, but with a little drop of venom in it. Nigel's clearly trying to take the Doctor, as John Nunn is called, the Doctor, out of his voluminous theoretical knowledge of the chess openings. Black putting his bishops on uh, the long diagonals, P.N. shutting the bishops, and White constructing a fortress in the middle of the board. Larry, any thoughts on this? No, it's a double fee and cheddar, very unusual for Black. Um, Black striking at the centre with his last move, White castles his king into safety. Black castles too. Black doesn't have serious problems yet. It's, it, it's a, a widely considered to be harmless, this opening. White really has to play very subtly to make anything out of it. Now, not as thinking as to whether the play is pawn up one square or two squares in front of the queen. I think both moves are quite viable, either d6, pawn to d6, or pawn to d5. But first he brings out his knight, nothing wrong with that, just developing a piece. It's difficult for white to get any real initiative in this opening. Pawn to a3, harmless little move on the edge, but the point is to deny the b4 square to the black knight after possible exchanges in the future. And John Nunn occupies the centre. I think that's a very good move. It's a fine move. I don't think White's got anything out of this opening. Do you, Larry? No, it's pretty even. It's even. The person who plays better in the middle game will uh, will win this game. The opening isn't going to decide anything either way. Well, there's an old maxim in chess, the better player will win, but it usually takes longer with black. Uh -huh. And White strikes out on the queen side. Gaining space. Black's got a choice. He can trade pawns either on b4 or d4 or push on paying his pawn to c4. Any other alternatives, Larry? No, I think he'll exchange and then take the, the d pawn. No. No, he's just left just it waiting. there. That's interesting. He's just allowing his pawn on c5 to be captured. Well, if White captures twice on c5, then. Black intends to play queen to uh, a5. Yes, he'll get the pawn back quite easily. Getting the pawn back, but there may be some difficulties. I think white's more liable to take off and perhaps play rook to b1 and occupy the open b file. Take once. Take once, trade once, b4, take c5, and then rook b1. Yes, that's what he's doing. Yes, he's do. traded off. And now rook to b1, yes, exactly what was predicted. The commentary team is patting itself on the back here. Mm, Congratulations cool. all round. That black has got a little bit of trouble. Yes, I, I don't like his move, that, that move A6. I mm -hmm. think it was superfluous. It didn't seem to add to the gaiety of nations there. I don't see the point of it. He's just giving White a slight plus on the queen side. But this, after all, was the psychological point of short opening. He was trying to avoid John Nunn's vast knowledge of opening theory. He was trying to play something a little bit unusual, throw John Nunn on his own resources. And uh, that move A6 has uh, justified uh, Short's idea. Now White is definitely getting the better of it. This is a tremendously strong move, which uh, none of us have 
totally overlooked when he played his queen to d7. Yeah. The threat is knight takes c5, winning the bishop on b7 with the fork against the queen and the bishop. Well, what the earth is he going to do now, Larry? Can you see a defence? This no, I incredible. think White is winning. Look, look, he's <laughs> leaning back now and straightening his uh, yes. tie. This is terrible. What a disaster. Yes, I mean, Queen I was, to d7 was terrible. I was saying uh, that uh, this game would not be decided in the opening. These players are much too strong. But this tremendously clever psychological ploy by Short, playing this highly unusual opening, has led to complete disaster for Black. Um, well, Black may have to play knight to e4. It doesn't help. He just takes it, and then knight takes c5. Well, then well, this is terrible. Bishop to c8. Pawn. Ghastly, absolutely ghastly. Knight takes pawn. White's a pawn up with an yeah. overwhelming position. Queen goes to the wretched square a7. Now White can win in a million ways. Queen to a4, for example. It's yes, he's played queen a4. Black is being pummeled into the ground here. Notice the White's also a minute ahead on the clock. <laughs> yes, and he's being absolutely destroyed here. The knight on c6 is attacked. He's a pawn down. What a wipeout! What a wipeout! And all credit to Nigel Short for this very clever psychological handling of the opening. Knight back to d8, grovelling retreat. Knight to e5 now surely is tremendously strong, invading in the centre. A cavalry charge by the white knights. Knight f3 to e5. Well, don't count black out. Remember last week, Spielman this, was a point this, ahead one, too. this one, Larry, is uh, <laughs> yeah, dead and beyond belief. Knight e5. If, if John Nunn, if John Nunn uh, survives this one, it's time for the garlic and the crucifixes. Time to call for Houdini. That's yeah, right. No. Knight to e6. And now... Uh, Knight to c6. Knight to c6 is, is tremendously strong. he takes strong. the knight. First he takes the knight. Yes. Uh, Black is still alive. He's only a pawn down. h3. This is a rather tame move. Rook to c8, Black's staging a small comeback. White Rook comes over, defending the pawn. Knight back, challenging the white knight. But now, now can't he play knight c6? Yes, knight c6, this yes, is it, this is it, this, this is, is it. it. Followed by knight takes pawn yes. on e7, check. Black completely collapsed, he overlooked that move. The queen is attacked, yes. none looking absolutely desperate, yes. very unhappy. His first ever loss to Nigel Short in a competition game, and what a way to go. Absolutely yes. ripped apart. Nigel look, looking very confident now. None is suffering. I can't see anything but uh, imminent resignation here. No. Well, he's he's playing on rook takes knight, giving up the very valuable rook for the knight. Queen takes back. Dominating position for white. Absolute control of the board. And the rook is coming into b7 Material with invasion. Ahead. Look at that. Black's queen is completely trapped. Yes. It's going to have to play <laughs> move like rook to e8. Utter devastation for uh, knight John to b8. Here. He's played rook e8, which is, of course, complete. The pawn on a6 is hanging now as well. Mm -hmm. It can be taken. White has a choice of rook to b7, attacking the black queen. Everything wins here. Everything is absolutely decisive. Queen must go back. Rook in. Now he can take What an pawn. invasion. Crushed. Queen takes pawn on a6. Everything being wiped yeah. out. Massacre. And uh, none has got... No. He's moved his queen. Queen on the white queen on a6, defended by the bishop, the white bishop, which has now come into b5. Very good opening strategy by Short, just very avoiding clever, anything sharp. Very clever indeed. Black completely tied up, the knight on d7 pinned. Bishop goes back. What a crossfire. None also very short of time. Two minutes behind on the clock. Queen lines up. Massive attack against the knight. Knight moves away. Rook in, attacking the queen. Yeah. Queen's gone. Surely the queen is gone. Yes. Yeah. Nigel Short wins and is in the final. So, a devastating win for Nigel Short, who goes through to the final at the expense of John Nunn. Join us for the final of the James Capel Speed Chess Challenge when Nigel Short plays the young boy from Truro, Michael Adams. Well, Speed Chess will be back on Thames in two weeks at its usual time of 1.25 because next week at half past one, it's what the papers say.